Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion. We're going to get started in just a minute, but I want to give a few of the stragglers a chance to join in, maybe grab some coffee, um, and just you know give everybody a chance so we don't have anyone missing anything. Um, but while we wait, uh, let's go ahead and do kind of a fun poll question just to get, get the blood flowing, get things moving. And for this first poll that we're going to do today, um, it is, what was the most prominent SEO challenge you faced in 2022? And this is, you know, we might even touch on some of these later uh, later this afternoon in this discussion. Um, but I'd like to get an idea of what, you know, how was everybody's year? You know, we're about to start the new, we're starting the new year. We're looking forward to 2023. There's a lot that seems to be ahead of us. Um, but I think it's always important to take a look back and, you know, see, you know, how we can learn, you know, before, you know, don't want to make the same mistakes twice, which we'll be covering a little bit about as, uh, as well later. So let's go ahead and let some of these votes come in. I'm going to check the attendee list, see how we're doing. Still got solid numbers coming in. Nice. I see some familiar faces or names. I can't see anyone's faces. Um, awesome. Cool. Let me do another refresh. Yep, still coming in. Yeah, and so um, of the most of these prominent SEO challenges that you might have faced in 2022, um, it could have been keeping up with search engine algorithm updates, tracking and understanding the performance of your SEO strategy or your website traffic and things like that. Just trying to understand all of those metrics and data and managing it well. Um, creating high ranking content. Uh, content creation is doesn't just come out of thin air, or at least. Not right now or not so much for the most part you know we'll be talking a little bit about that later um or you know identifying what areas to focus on to improve your search ranking it's you know i, I mean i feel like i've run into that problem before where you're you're looking at a big project such as your business's seo strategy and you're just saying where in the world do i begin how do i start what am i even doing wrong or right um you know trying to have an understanding you know of something like that could be you know challenging for sure all righty, so I'm going to do one more attendee list research. Looks good. It looks like the numbers are slowing down. So let's go ahead and take a look at the poll results. And it looks like, yep, that uh, D or the fourth answer, identifying what areas to focus on to improve search ranking. And I think that might be one of just the biggest challenges of, of SEO in general is like, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing, am, is what I'm doing helping me? It could, you know, it could be hurting you without if you don't know any better. Um, so, you know, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, but before we dive into the discussion, uh, let's just go over a little bit of housekeeping. And um, so first and foremost, I'm your host and digital marketing enthusiast at BirdEye. My name is Justin Meredith, and welcome to today's show. We have an amazing discussion planned for you guys today. Um, and Bob, you know, and before we go in, let's go over some of this uh, this dashboard that you guys should be seeing on your screen. In the top left corner, you should see the media player or my camera or my face, hello, uh, as well as our speakers who I'm going to introduce in just a second. Uh, below that, you should see our presenters' bios if you want to learn a little bit more about myself, Ben, or Steve. Uh, feel free to take a look and learn more about us, and you can also connect with us on LinkedIn from there as well. Uh, just to the right, more in the kind of the middle of your screen, you should see the slides uh, that we'll be going through. Uh, feel free to take notes um, and go back and watch. So also... That's a good point. The recording will be made available for you guys as soon as the broadcast is over. So if you have to jump out a little bit early, uh, don't worry, because you will be able to go back and view it. And if you want to you know, look at the slides a little bit closer, we've got some really cool um, stuff planned for you guys. So I definitely want to make sure you guys get all the value from that. Uh, to the right of the slides is our uh, request demo. If you're curious to see how BirdEye works and how it could help your business, how it could elevate your business's online reputation and make managing your presence on Google just a lot easier and save you a ton of time. Be sure to check that out. Um, below the slides is the Q&A and the attendee chat. Feel free to submit questions to us in the Q&A. Uh, we'll try to go through as many as we can. And if we can't, we will have somebody reach out to you through email uh, with an answer. So if you don't think that we're going to be able to get to it, don't worry. We are going to try to answer your questions to the best we can. We even saved a little bit of time for the end of this webinar, or we actually added a little bit of time compared to our other episodes because we've been getting so many questions. So we should be able to get to everything. 
uh, below, to, just to the right of the Q&A is the attendee chat. And this is like a comment section. So feel free to just to drop in, say hi, um, make any kind of comments, ask questions, uh, just really kind of hang out. And then uh, to the top right of your screen is our related content. And this is really cool because what we're able to do is provide you guys with some awesome, awesome uh, content guides and assets that you guys can use to help with your SEO and your online reputation strategy and journey. Um, so the first is the Reviews to Revenue Masterclass series. This is a four-part webinar series that actually, I think, Steve, you might have been on the first episode of this one, um, where we basically break down everything that you need to know and what you need to do in order to develop, build, manage, and grow a strong online reputation. It's packed with all kinds of stuff. So the link in there, the top link, it should take you to a landing page that has all of the episodes, as well as our ebook slash guide type of thing that kind of is like a textbook for the masterclass series. It's really, really cool and comprehensive. Um, we've gotten, you know, comments from people who, who attended these live, who, you know, have told us, you know, it's like, hey, these guys, this has been super helpful. We've been able to implement some of the strategies already and we're seeing results. It's been really, really awesome. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, it's all on demand, so you can watch it as soon as you're done with this webinar today. Um, and below that, we have our February webinar already up and planned, and it's eight ways to get more Google reviews in 2023. Um, as we're going to learn a little bit more, we're going to have a lot to go through uh, when it comes to Google and Google reviews. And so, you know, uh, with this with this next webinar, it's going to really focus on what you need to do to bring in more reviews, but not only just bring them in, but respond to them you know, well in you know, the best way possible so that you can uh, maximize the impact of those reviews as well as managing all of the data and actually using your reviews to make smarter business decisions. Um, and then uh, below that, we have our SEO local search checklist, which is a really helpful uh, PDF type of guide that you can print out and use to kind of do a self audit or a self evaluation of your business's online presence or your, your uh, kind of your SEO strategy and has all the checklists as all the materials that you that you need in order to set yourself up for success. And then lastly, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, our social media manager, Jody, just to shout out to her, she posts some incredible content. Just about everything on there is meant to help and educate and basically help you guys be better at on being online with your business, essentially, is kind of the, is the simplest way I could put it. It's a really cool, the, the timelines is on that page is really, really good. Um, ben, Steve, and I actually, we just got done with the live stream on Tuesday, talking a little bit about this webinar on our LinkedIn page. So be sure to check that out as well. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guests, uh, Ben Fisher and Steve Wiedemann. First off, Ben is one of only a few certified Google Business Profile Diamond product experts in the United <laughs> States. Um, really, I'm just happy that you're here, Ben. i um, excited to you know, talk to you again. You've been on the past few of these Local Search Expert Series uh, webinars, uh, and it's been an absolute blast. Um, he, so as ben, you know, Ben's been helping businesses grow their online presences, presence since 1994. He's a frequent contributor to the Business Profile Forum. He's also the co-founder of Steady Demand, which is an actual, like a local SEO company focused on Google Business Profiles. His team, Steady Demand, specializes in helping clients fight map, Google Map or Map Spam, navigating the most complex business profile issues and troubleshooting you know, ranking issues on Google. Uh, up next, we have Steve Wiedemann. And Steve has been a longtime uh, partner of mine with these webinars. I think we've been doing these for over a year now, uh, and he's no stranger to BirdEye. Uh, he's helped countless businesses with their Google search related questions. He's an adjunct professor at UCSD and the author of the textbook, SEO Strategy and Skills. And on top of all of that, he's also the CEO and senior search strategist at Wiedemann Consulting Group. Steve and his team, are, they're dubbed the agency's agency has served some of the world's largest brands in the e-commerce, service, and franchise industries. Whew, awesome. All right, Steve and Ben, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, that was just a mouthful. I'm glad I got through that part so we can actually get to uh, discussing today's topics. How are yeah, you guys this doing? This isn't about us. This is about the people who are listening. So yeah, let's get to it. <laughs> Thanks for awesome. having us, Justin. It's always, yeah. as always, it's a pleasure to be with you. And of course, my good friend, Steve here. 
And like Steve said, yeah, it's not about us, right? I mean, you can find about us online any anytime. It's really about answering everybody's questions. So let's do it. And that's and that's what we're here to do. Um, and we're here to talk about 2023. And we're also going to take a look back at 2022. So as we jump into this discussion, let's take a look at the agenda and see what exactly we have planned. So first, like I said, we're going to look back at 2022. We're going to see how the landscape of local SEO has evolved and changed over the past 12 months. Then we are going to look forward to 2023, and Ben and Steve are going to provide their bold predictions for the new year. Um, Then we're going to talk a little bit about where Google business profiles are headed, because as we've been seeing, Google business profiles has started to evolve into your business center uh, for Google, which makes sense. Um, But it's been, Google's been, you know, bolster or beefing up Google business profiles and their capabilities uh, for the past few years now. And so we're going to talk about where, what direction those are headed in. Uh, then we're going to cover some SEO myths and then we'll, we'll end it with some tips and takeaways and then go into a Q&A session. Now, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing that we're going to do is take a look back at 2022. And 2022 was an eventful year for SEOs. And a lot of the newsworthy events and things that happened in 2022 are going to carry over into this year. But one thing is for sure, though, local search is as crucial as ever. 46% of all Google searches including lo- include local intent. Um, that's about 1.6 billion searches per day have some sort of local or local business intent to them. So let's take a look at some of the highlights from this past year. Uh, and just a heads up, this is not the entire full highlights. There is so much that happened in 2022. Uh, we would need a five-part series to cover everything, um, at least. But you know, these are some of the key highlights that we think made strong impacts on local businesses across the board. Um, ben and Steve, if there's anything outside of these you want to add in, feel free. Uh, but we can go ahead and go through. And so the first one I want to talk to you guys about is Google's uh, Webmaster Guidelines is now Google Search Essentials. Um, and, you know, Google has a tendency to kind of change the name of their things. Like, you know, we had the Google all business the profiles, you know, they change their names <laughs> to things all the time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Google Webmaster Guidelines and or at least, I guess, now the Google Search Essentials, what they are, you know, kind of what they do, essentially? Ben, you can go first. Actually, Steve, I was going to say you go first. <laughs> Sure. Well, like, like you mentioned, Justin, they're they're changing things all the time. And one of one of the ways that you can keep up with all these these page changes, despite whatever <laughs> name they change, is is setting up an alert. And it's it's really easy to do. I I like to use a tool called Visual Ping, Visual P I N G. So whenever there is an update, like even this morning, there was a very slight update to Google's SEO starter guide that's been out there for years and years and years. And it's great because whenever there is an update, I'll get a little email. We'll say this page has changed here's what changed because that way I don't have to kind of study the page and go, gee, I wonder what's different, right? It it actually tells you, here's the text that changed. Here's the image that changed. And it's a great way to kind of keep up with what's going on. The, for, for local businesses, I think it's really important to look at those local search guidelines. I know Ben, you, you pick up those alerts for that page. So you, you're always on top of it. And I love following your posts on search engine land and all the great places you write. So um, that's, that's been, uh, I think a really critical part for any business that's looking to, to keep up with the changes that are happening and not be caught by surprise. If every day you're looking at your your rankings and the search results and you're number three, um, and then all of a sudden one day you log in and you're just you're gone, what happened? Well, you would have gotten an alert that maybe there was a new field that you could have added uh, or um, that you could have uh, uh, filled out. Maybe a checkbox you could have hit for open 24 hours or uh, virtual consultations available. So I think the guidelines, um, despite whatever name changes, uh, they happen to make, you know, are, are just something everyone should follow. Now, here's something else I've noticed that people don't do. They read, they go, that's interesting. They talk about it, and then it goes away. But if you're a smart digital marketer and you're running digital marketing for, you know, uh, an enterprise or maybe you're an agency, what I like to do, and this is how I got started in SEO, is I create little checklists off of everything that Google says. We have a, a checklist for content, right, where we look at content guidelines from tech, and uh, writing styles and uh, and so forth. We've got a checklist for technical items that you'll find in web.dev. Everything that we learn that they share that's new goes into this checklist so that when we're doing our, our audits every year of how we're performing, we don't have to go through pages and pages of guidelines. Instead, what we do is we extrapolate all that into a beautiful little checklist and we just kind of go through and check boxes. Um, so I would say the one thing that, that um, 
if if anything that I would pay attention to beyond name changes is you know getting those alerts so that you know when something changed and two taking all of that and putting it into a spreadsheet or maybe even just a Google sheet. Yeah, I will say with this one thing. I mean, <clears throat> right with with Google Business Profiles. I mean, they've changed that name now. I can think it's like four, or maybe five times. Google I think. Base, Google My Business, Google Local, Google Local Plus, Google Local. whatever. You know, it's like. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is, is like with this last name change and how it kind of relates to this, is that you know we 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 learned internally from Google, right, in our discussions with them, that they use. Uh, basically two aspects to decide if they're going to name change, change, uh, change a name. And that is basically looking at Google Trends, number one, globally. And then they'll also do tons of user group studies with people to understand kind of what people are calling it. And uh, the goal for, the, for them when they make these name changes is really is to just make it as simple and as easy to understand for the guy who is a plumber, his job as a plumber. And if he looks at it, he goes, okay, Google search essentials. Well, okay, that makes sense, right? I'm not a webmaster. It's a search essential. So um, so that's always something to keep in mind. And people get all crazy when they make these name changes. You know, of course, we as webmasters, right, marketers, we get crazy about it. And we're like, oh, God, we have to memorize this now and change the way we're talking about it. But in reality, we're, just, we're, a, minority, we're a minority when it comes to Google's ecosystem. Uh, as marketers. So they're always doing something for the user. And um, also, but Steve, did you know that the Google's quality rater guidelines I were know, also I changed? Uh -huh. Which is which is actually our next bullet. We get into uh, some of those extra add-ons to the EAT. <laughs> exactly. <Awesome. laughs> uh, and uh, Steve, while you were talking about the that first bullet point, we had somebody jump into the uh, attendee chat and they were asking uh, what the name of that alert tool was oh visual ping p-i-n-g visual p-i-n-g and i think awesome. you get up to five free alerts a month but you can buy credits for pennies it's super cheap nice awesome so, yeah i, so let's keep I going. actually use that tool oh. also for for specific products that are out of date i have a favorite beer that i follow on a a site that is the only site that actually sells the beer online. And so whenever it goes from sold out to not sold out, I get an <laughs> alert and I jump in there and get my favorite drink every year. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun tool. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So the next one is uh, EAT is now EEAT. Uh, but the new E uh, being experience. Uh, ben, do you want to break down that? And then Steve, you can go. Yeah, sure. Or vice versa, whichever way. Yeah, I mean, well, so EEAT is, you know, uh, and Lily Ray actually wrote this really wonderful article on Search Engine Land about this. I was going to give her a shout out, too. Yeah. And, uh, and she also Good. includes all the quality uh, the, the quality reader guideline updates as well. It's a really, really well done article. Um, and I'll admit, this is like the area that I'm weak in. So. But, you know, it's about experience, expertise, authoritiveness, and trustworthiness, right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's being a very transparent kind of brand, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, if we, we look at what people want and what we want from, from search in general, is we want to learn from people who have experience. We want to learn from people who have expertise, right? And that are authoritative. They know what they're saying. They believe in what they're saying. And ultimately are trustworthy. Right, and they're not just saying things for the sake of business or for the sake of, or whatnot. So it's about education. Um, what's your what's your take on this, Steve? You know, it's almost what was it, 170 pages of a guideline. Uh, one of yeah. uh, one of my clients actually asked me to come in and spend the day with his senior SEO, and we we spent an entire day reading through nearly 170 pages of these quality guidelines in a day. And it was really interesting because there's no there's no direct correlation to you know that the third-party quality raters who are looking, you know, at, at, at these individual listings that go directly into uh, a change in a position of one of those listings. It's really more uh, about them getting feedback from that third party to adjust rankings at scale, right? So you don't have to worry about, hey, if my page doesn't rank, a quality rater is going to look at it and demote it. That doesn't happen. It's never going to happen, right? But it is about them sharing with the, the search engines, you know, what they're noticing and uh, where the patterns and trends are so that they can adjust and get better at the quality of the results. So don't worry about the quality rater guidelines 
from a, you know, is, is someone going to manually look at my site and pull it out of the rankings? That's just not going to happen. Um, on the, the side of what we should be paying attention to, and, and they, they talk about all sorts of things in, in this novel, uh, things such as your money, your life. So if you're, if you're selling a product or a service that can have an impact on somebody's health, right, or on their finances, like significantly, not a $10, you know, product that you would buy, but something that would be a big financial investment, um, you know, they're going to put a little more scrutiny on that, and they're going to look for specific things. We we remember there was this, this period where SEOs were calling an update a medic update, and they kept coming back and saying, it's not a medic update, even though even though we know it affects mostly healthcare websites, it's not a medic update. Um, but it, it really was. And, you know, I, I know Lily talked about this quite a bit as well during you know, a lot of the talks that she's had around EAT. But what what we did was we simply reverse engineered those sites that were performing well after this big update. And of course, all these new changes that they're making are really more refinements to, you know, a, a core shift in how Google's looking at results. So by reverse engineering the top pages, we found a site, Healthline, and it came up almost, geez, almost 85% of the time when you're searching for anything healthcare related, where mm. prior to that, you would have got like Mayo Clinic or something else. And what we found in that, that research was they were specifically stating whether the page was fact-checked or not. And you can, you can do like, um, do a search for maybe any kind of keto content, right? K-E-T-O, um, keto benefits or something. Look for the Healthline page that shows up. I don't know if it's still number one or somewhere in the top results, but study that page. And what you'll notice, other than the fact check little icon that they have and, and some, um, some expertise mention of you know, who the doctor is and why they're certified or the expert and why they're certified to be able to talk about that topic. But they did some other really interesting things, too. In the page itself, they, they, when they linked out, they linked out with more like um, footnote links, number one, number two, number three, versus keyword links. The keyword links were all for internal content. And I thought that was really interesting because now they're they're not having to worry about keyword cannibalization by linking out to a website and giving that vote to somebody else with the keywords they want to appear for. They're using all the keyword rich links to benefit their own content and to link to their own content. I thought that was super interesting. But the EAT side of it, you know, we looked at at multiple factors. Number one was that fact check was number one. Uh, two was the ability for the user to be able to search the site. Three was contact information available. If somebody purchased or, or bought from you, uh, is there contact information? Is there um, return refund um, uh, policy information? Is all that information available? So if, if a customer had a, an issue or, or a problem, they could they can get an answer to it quickly. So the search feature, the, the contact, um, uh, other things that we noticed too, uh, had to do with uh, privacy policies, which I thought was interesting. Um, you know, because that's never really been a, a ranking signal yet. If you don't have one, that like Google ads will uh, disapprove your ad and not really tell you why. And then you add back a privacy policy link and suddenly your ads are going again. You know, um, so I think on the EEAT side, beyond just adding in the experience attribute and, and having, you know, a, a solid reputation as a brand and not doing, um, you know, anything shady or sketchy that might put you in, um, you know, in a bad place with Google. I think, I think um, what I would focus on is just always trying to provide the most helpful content to your customers and and asking questions. Running, you know, spend a couple hundred bucks and run, a, you know, a, a usability test. Bring some people in, some students, some college students, and say, you know, college students, I want to pay you all, you know, twenty bucks for coming in for an hour, um, and I want all of you to use our website and give suggestions on how we can make it easier. You know, that just start with something as simple as that. Ask your own customers, how was your experience? What could we do better? And then take all that feedback, you know, run a pivot table to see the most common things and make those updates, you know, or even test them first to see how it improves, how long they stay on your site, how likely they are to convert, and more importantly, whether they leave or not. Because at the end of the day, regardless of how relevant your content is and how popular you are when other websites are linking to you and mentioning, to, mentioning your brand, if users aren't selecting you in the search results or worse, they're selecting you and then returning to the search results and choosing a different final place to, you know, to, to stay, uh, that long-term search behavior signal will, will tell the search engines, hey, maybe this wasn't a very helpful listing because it didn't stay very long. And that's what this is really about at the end of the day is keeping them on our website and not 
not um, having them go back to the search results and choose a competing listing. Because enough of that behavior over time, as it's being recorded by Google and being in other search engines, is a signal that, hey, this you know, this site might not have been very helpful. So that's my take on the, the EAT side. Uh, if you want to read the guidelines, you, you can you can do that, but there's plenty of summaries about it. Uh, we mentioned Lily Ray's article. Mm -hmm. You can just do a really quick search for Lily Ray EAT and yeah. see tons of incredible content. Mm -hmm. If you want to get the most recent, just change your filter in the tools option in search to say the last 30 days, and you'll get the more uh, recent updates. But, uh, but if you're more interested in that, Lily is the expert for sure. Nice. And yeah. uh, I posted the, a link to the article that she that she oh, had written about that awesome. as well in the attendee chat. Uh, so if you guys want to check that out after the webinar, you definitely can. I think yeah. I highly recommend it. She she does have great breakdowns of how that stuff yeah. kind of just happens. Yeah. It's crazy. And she's also, a rad uh, DJ. Too. Trust is king. That's all I can say. I mean, yeah. there's an awesome uh, explanation of ETH there with Steve really was. Um, but yeah, cool. Nice. And I do, right. I do have a writing uh, guide uh, a checklist. We were talking about checklists before. So we, we extrapolated some of that. So Justin, after the event, I'll post a link to that. So if anyone wants to audit their own content using you know what was extracted from those quality guidelines, uh, by all means, check it out. Uh, let me know what you think. And uh, hopefully it's helpful as you're you know doing your own audit or pay a college student. I, I teach, by the way, if you want an intern or if you want a, a marketing student to do some stuff, um, hit me up. I'm sure they'd love to do some volunteer work for you so awesome cool so let's go ahead and keep it moving we still have a ton of stuff to go through uh yep. the next is page two of google no longer exists infinite um, scroll is this... here <laughs> 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 i have that in my update list yep. yeah i mean it started on mobile right you know last year it started on mobile as everything with google does you know uh, if you don't know that in the audience by the way look to mobile to see what's coming to desktop. Um, and then it, it extended out to desktop and now it's even extending out to maps too, by the way. So if you go into and you click on more businesses, when you do a local search, the in the what's called the local categorical finder, uh, now it's starting to go infinite as well, if there are a lot of more than 10 results, of course. But um, I think it's I interesting. Like it. I think it's a better, I think it's a better experience. I, I don't think there's any negative impact to, to SEO unless you're using a, a rank tracker that uses pages instead of uh, position. You know. <laughs> oh, it broke a lot of rank trackers. It broke a lot of our tools, I can tell you that. <laughs> but I, I haven't, in any of the data that I've seen, I haven't seen any ranking implications. Some some industries might have seen something. Shopping, I know changed completely is one of the updates that we'll talk about You know, from last year. But uh, beyond the, the landscape of uh, shopping results, um, the infinite scroll hasn't hasn't really caused any sort of negative implications for any of our clients. And we we have restaurant chains, we've got uh, attorneys, you know, we've got a uh, HVAC franchise. Uh, no no changes to uh, performance, clicks, um, any of of that sort of um, uh, impact at all. So mm -hmm. yep. just a better overall user experience for searchers, I think. Nice. You know, and I think you know potentially it could lead to hopefully more traffic on those pages that normally rank on because uh, I think the continuous scroll covers six pages worth of Google results before you get to the bottom and it tells you to see more. Um, I'm curious to see if that results in more people seeing results from those pages two through six now that it's all on that same page and it's you know and it, it remind, I mean it makes sense because if you you know most people are on their phones and when you're looking at social media it's an infinite scroll. And so you're constantly scrolling back. Like, you know, you could be on Twitter and all of a sudden you're looking at stuff from two days ago. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm curious to see if that, you know, might have an effect on the traffic to those pages as time goes on. That'd be um, interesting, but I can tell you transactional queries, people don't generally go to page, what was page two. They don't generally do a lot of scrolling when they're looking for a, a product or a service and, and they're in that mode of, I need to hire or buy. They don't generally do a lot of, of you know, uh, position 11 through 100 research, uh, but someone who's doing some um, fact checking or knowledge research, you know, for more than anything else, you know, it's it's page two is and and below is about um, solving problems and building brand awareness. So I think I think it is a great way if you've got some remarketing uh, available to to bring people back in who did an informational search. Um, you know, but I don't think from a transactional standpoint, it's going to have a negative impact. 
uh, whatsoever. But page two is and three is really for researchers, you know, people who are looking a little bit deeper into something or trying to, you know, to, to prove that they're right to their spouse. Right. And I, I went to Google and here's what it said. And, you know, five pages later, you find an article you you remember from six years ago. Right. So yeah, still, that's not tricking the book. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. So let's keep moving. Uh, and I also I see um, Marion. Uh, I see the question that you just submitted and um, we can go ahead and answer it real fast. And so she and, and they're asking, is it a good idea to put as many pictures of the products I sell um, and Dean ponchos, alpaca shawls and organic jewelry? On my website, P.S. Totally. The website will be ready in five to seven days. Google loves yeah. images. <laughs> yeah, it's Do one it of the things day. that. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be talking about it today, but um, Google image search is so important right now, especially the images that you put on your website. Somebody does a search for uh, Andine ponchos, which I have no idea what that is, but I'm going to go look it up <laughs> later. Um, you know, the 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 possibility of it showing up in a thumbnail image of your product in search is very high. So, uh, yeah, we're visual creatures. Do it. What do you think, Steve? A hundred percent. And it's actually one of the topics I was hoping we get to today because, uh, you know, the, the AI behind it, there's an actual, and, and Justin, I shared this with you before the uh, event today, and you're more than welcome to socialize those links as well. Uh, but I, I did this fun little um, Google Maps amplification um, write up of kind of some things that you could do. And what one of the things is to take your image and drop it into Google's image recognition API. And I honestly didn't even know they had this technology till Mike Blumenthal introduced me to it uh, with the group he was working with called AirCam, who's now partnering with everyone, you know, to provide uh, Google image verified, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I want to use? An image verified platform. So in other words, you take your picture of pancakes and you drop it in the Google recognition test tool and it says, there's about a 70% probability this is pancakes. So you take your camera out, you take another angle, and then you upload it again. It says, this is about 90% probability this is pancakes. Like, that's my image. I'm going to upload that image. And then two weeks later, you know, somebody performs a search for uh, pancakes near Anaheim or whatever. And then your listing shows up on the maps. And lo and behold, there's your 90% uh, probability image uh, of pancakes right there in the SERP. It's really, really exciting. And it's, it's fun to see how without old school image optimization, file name, metadata, mm -hmm. Um, alt attributes, captions, all those things that we used to do, um, you know, with Google image recognition, you don't need to do those things anymore. You just need to make sure you've got a really clear, high definition, high quality image, and bam, you're there without any of that metadata. It's really exciting. Yeah. And I, I imagine this helps <clears throat> with uh, Google Lens searches as well. Yeah. Um, yeah for when the users, don't, I don't know what this is. I'm going to put a picture of it. I do this all the time with like bugs oh, yeah. and plants. Like is this spider poisonous in my apartment? And I'll do put it, you know, do Google Lens, and I'll try to find it online. Yeah. Um, and so I think you know that would probably help on that side of things as well, too, right? For sure. Yeah, I, I actually, <clears throat> uh, I actually know quite a lot about this topic. Uh, I'm involved in a project called Image Ranks, which basically taps into the Cloud Vision API, right? Which is what uh, AirCam does, and um, it's really quite an interesting what you can do when you actually run it through the tool and you pull out basically the, the, the semantic entities, what they call labels um, from it. You know, it will uh, identify you're wearing glasses, you know, the type of shirt you have, the text on your shirt, everything like that. And Google's indexing all of this data. Um, and then you can even input even more type of metadata. And then when you put those images on your website, Google's gonna actually read all of that. But anyway, that's about images. <laughs> Really, really neat tech, and you know, and in, in, in those guides I'd mentioned, you know, it, it walks you through um, just some very simple things you can do. Get get directions, you know, to work when you, um, you know, when you head out. When you get there, uh, take some pictures. Maybe even just one a day of something you haven't taken a picture of before. You know, um, you might do some cropping and and some editing to make sure that um, you know it it recognizes exactly what you're trying to get a picture of. You know, you might have to zoom in a bit. Uh, but it's it's kind of fun to do. And if you did it every day, you're talking, what, 365 images, particularly if you have like signage and, and um, you know, things like that, that will help the user. Lens is fun. You mentioned that, Justin, you can you can take a picture when you're out and say, where am I? You know, and, and depending on on whether or not they've they've captured that image, they'll say, oh, you're, you know, on this street in Berlin right now. And you're like, how did you know? This is so weird. You know, um, Lens is a, a really fun tool to play around with, for sure. 
And um, that tool that would kind of give you the percentage chance of this, these pancakes are pancakes, was that image ranks or what was the name of that? Google uh, image recognition tool. Google image recognition tool. Awesome. So we we received a question about that. So I just wanted to cover it. It's free to play with. Awesome. Okay. Now, um, now the next two things, we have changes to Google business profiles and AI and machine learning. We don't need to touch on these right now because we're about to jump right into those. So we can go ahead and keep the ball moving. I don't want to, I want to make sure we save enough time for Q and A and open discussion with any of the other questions that uh, the audience, uh, anyone here may be submitting. So let's keep it going. And let's look ahead to 2023 outlook and bold predictions. Ben, uh, I think you can go ahead and start here. And yeah. let's talk a little bit about this. All right. So for those of you who are not familiar, that image right there was actually created with MidJourney. Uh, it's a Discord tool that creates AI, basically images based on a huge data set. Um, the images are, are really, the images themselves are bold and beautiful. Uh, the prompt that I used to create this <clears throat> was an AI Googlebot reading Google search. And that's what it came up with, basically. And I put in a whole bunch of modifiers as far as prompts go. But I'm going to be honest, I like the one of Justin better, Ben. <laughs> yeah, we're going to show that one, too. <laughs> but um, I really I really wish we got a diet. You could have gotten the one for you, though, Steve. I really do. I'll show it to you later. All right. So, but yeah. So, um, I mean, AI, AI is all the rage right now. Everybody is talking about AI. Uh, Midjourney has really, I mean, not Midjourney, um, Chat GPT, you know, it, it, it's basically accelerated people talking about it, um, you know, and the GPT system, you know, I mean, it's it's basically a predictive text type of learning system. And it's based on data sets that are from 2001 and before. So if you type in Google business profile, it's gonna go, uh, yeah, you meant Google my business, right? But actually, believe it or not, it actually understands the two now. But anyway, um, but yeah, I, I really think that, that the number of tools and the amount of content that is going to come out that's going to be AI driven is just going to continue to basically uh, exponentially increase. We've already seen, you know, now that um, ChatGPT has a, a uh, API, there's all sorts of tools that are coming out right now. There's originality.ai, which you introduced me to the other day, Steve. You know, Chrome which extension. I love it. Exactly. Yeah. It's a Chrome extension that will check content and base and score it. I love it. Score it on, you know, how original is it? Was it? How much was percentage was Play created through it. AI? Mm-hmm. And what the percentage was that's plagiarized. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, some marketers that I'm in a group that I'm in were talking about this the other day of, or I'm sorry, Twitter chat of, you know, hey, should you let your clients generate content, you know, using AI? The poll came back resoundingly like, no, (laughs) absolutely not. Because there's some of the things that go along with it. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later um, about how the tools can really be misused and also misread, Um, especially since they don't even cite their own sources. Oh, sorry, Ben. I didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, do you have yeah. the do you have the name of that Chrome extension? That yeah, that uh, was originality.ai. Originality.ai. And they have a website for it too. Um, super, super cool stuff. Yeah, and, 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 and it sounds like uh, Bing is going to be uh, using this technology here pretty soon. So, it'll, but prediction is that a lot of SEOs, digital marketers, are going to be you know, keeping their eye on Bing and seeing if Bing is able to get some more of that search market share that they've continued to lose over the years. Um, exactly. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to watch because, you know, having a, a, a search engine that includes uh, the, the chat GBT tech is going to be really, really interesting. So uh, whether it's one of these things where everyone jumps in and it's all a rage, a rage and fashion and then eventually dies out, or if it's something that continues to develop and and you know, Bing figures out how to how to really help uh, businesses, you know, get the most visibility using you yeah. know that kind of tech. It's going to be interesting to watch. I think it's was it March or so. I think that we're going to start seeing some of that uh, go live. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's somewhere around there. Um, my, my mom uses uh, Bing, so I'm sure she'll be happy. <laughs> Hi, mom. Well, and the thing is, is I mean, you mentioned Bing, but there's already a couple people out there, and I forget them off the top of my head. But there are some. AI search engines that are already out there. They're trying really hard to be AI search engines and incorporate uh, new data sets into it. 
they're failing miserably, um, you know. And I guess another prediction I would have, which is more of a short-term prediction for this year, and that is, is that if Chat GPT does not fix some of their problems, it's going to sputter out and die real quick, and somebody else is going to come along and and figure something out. But chances of that happening are pretty slim, especially with all the money that Microsoft put into it. <laughs> You want to, hey, we were just talking about experience, experience and expertise. You, you want to do something really interesting. Uh, the other day, Ben, you you posted on Slack. You said, uh, you know, hey, chat, CBG, write me a, CBT, write me a, um, a table of contents for a book on local <laughs> SEO. Yeah. And it was great. I mean, I, I probably would have changed a couple of the, the items, but overall, it was, it was a really good thing. I'm like, wow. So businesses, if they want to become more experts on on their industry, they can ask for those chapter ideas. And then yeah. they can use their own experience to fill in the blanks and create a book. And when someone says, why should we hire you? And you say, well, we wrote the book on it, you know, and it's self-published that thing. And now you've got some, uh, uh, you know, expertise and, um, you know, experience to show your customers that you're the best at the job because you wrote a book. And if you don't know what to write it on, ask chat. GPT. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, and at the end of the day, it's like chat GPT is, um, I think is great for coming up with ideas, you know, you see people look doing Excel formulas, you know, or writing Perl scripts. Brett Tapke wrote a Perl script for it with it, you know, um, uh, WordPress plugins, all sorts schema of things markup. like schema. Oh, yeah, schema market, breadcrumb markup, you yeah. know, all of that. I mean, it can't scrape your website, but if you put it in the URL, it'll take the URL and expl extrapolate it. Um, yeah. So it, can it be a time saver? Heck yeah. Uh, if you're going to use it for writing, do you need an editor? Oh, yes. <laughs> you absolutely need an editor. Anyway, yep. uh, that's awesome. my predictions for AI for, for this year. Where I think we're going to get into some more examples, though, going on. All right. By the way, that's and... super Justin. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Look at that. That's amazing. And Henry Cavill <laughs> just uh, retired from D.C., Justin, so there's that's an opening. Right. There's, there's an opening. An opening. So if you're, fr if you're from, the, the, from D.C. and you're watching this and you need a new Superman, I'm your guy. Might need some CGI exactly. to help with those muscles, but I'm happy. I'm happy to help. Um, and so we were just talking a little bit about being an Apple. Uh, you know, expecting to make big moves from that. Uh, you know, with an AI type of search engine. Um, what do you have a little bit more on that? I'm I'm really anxious to see Applebot hit our website. Um, you know, and. and it's been it's been in the making for several years now. You know they've been working on their own, um, you know, specific search engine beyond just you know what they've been doing with Siri. So and and now that with Apple Connect, I know Ben's going to talk more about that, but um, they're being more open to businesses being able to manage their own uh, business information. Where previously you had to use a platform or a you know a, a data management uh, provider to. Uh, to even get your business into Apple Maps, so now they're they're being more open about it, and they're they're trying to, um, I think they're trying to broaden, you know, what their their um, reach is with businesses. So um, everyone's excited about it. It's going to be really really interesting to watch. For me, I'm I'm watching on the the website to see if they're going to actually create a competitor to to Google and Bing with their own Apple Search, and if people are going to be going to you know some Apple Search site to search instead of Google. That'll be uh, be interesting to watch, but on the local side of things now with Apple Connect, you can go in, edit your business information, add a lot of really helpful information, and um, it'll be interesting to watch. Being we just talked about how they're integrating the the, the AI here pretty soon, so that that's going to be really exciting to see, especially because we really don't hear about Bing very often, and I think competition's healthy. It'd be nice to not see you know Google have all the market share, and you know to have a second uh, opinion on results and be able to go to a different search engine with completely different results, you know, to find more ideas for, you know, what you're looking for, whether you're shopping or, um, you know, doing an informational search. Um, yeah, I'm, I can talk about the second one too, but I want to hear what Ben says about Apple Connect. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so if, first of all, Apple Business Connect, okay. Yeah. Who, who would have thought A, B, C? Just <laughs> saying, alphabet, A, B, C, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Is it a little bit of a dig, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, no, but seriously, so <laughs> let's just take a look at a couple high-level things here. Is number one, um, you know, uh, I used to believe that, that that Google Maps was all the rage um, until I got an iPhone, and I love Apple Maps 
I will be the first person to say that, I guess. I don't know. I do love map maps. Um, you know, with the Apple Business Connect, <clears throat> the the feature parity to Google Business Profile Management <laughs> Manager uh, is um, is amazing. Actually, they've gone ahead and they've integrated so many things that that they've taken. I, I would say they've taken it basically from Google, um, and it's in there. And then what they've done is they've done deep connections into the Apple ecosystem. So uh, with all of those things to be considered, I, I think that's going to be a huge move. Now, the thing that Apple Maps or Apple Business uh, Connect, it doesn't have is support for service area based businesses, which Google does. Yes. Google does it kind of well. I don't know if Apple's going to actually adopt that or not, but if they're looking to take that market share, they're going to have to figure out how to. Um, I, I, I can tell you a real easy way they could do it, Ben. They could make the listing URLs indexable by Google and show up in Google search results with Apple Maps listings. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, why now? <laughs> but you know, so it's it's going to be interesting, I think. And um, I, the, I think that a lot of businesses are going to now get into Apple, and it's going to make it a lot more useful for Apple Maps. Um, the only thing that that's kind of concerning to me a little bit is that there's no there's no re recurring component to it. There's nothing to continually optimize and do. It's kind of a, you go in like and you just done it. And <laughs> you're done basically. So I'll be excited to see if they actually start doing things like, you know, adding things like posts and things like that to it as well. Something to keep an eye on for sure. Oh yeah. Um, the next, next one that we had in line was the uh, semantic web piece. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to go go on uh, with regards to Bing or Apple Ben before we move on to this one? Because this one's kind of this one's kind of nerdy. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I, Justin, I, the, how are we, where are we doing on time? We've got fourteen minutes. Uh, yeah, we do have the time booked for a little bit more than that, um, but I do want to save time for questions. Uh, but we Sweet. could probably um, skip over a couple of things later on. Let's uh, definitely talk about semantic web though, because this this yeah, is a definitely. fun topic. Yeah, yeah it really yeah. is. So yeah, the the way the way that the web started was you would create some HTML and you throw it up on your website. Search engines like Googlebot and Bingbot, um, Slurp, which was Yahoo's bot back in the day, <laughs> uh, would crawl through your website <laughs> and yeah. try to interpret what the page was about based on words that they found and and the structure of those words and headings and subheadings and bold and emphasized text and so forth. They try to figure it out on their own. And then this whole idea of, of structured markup came out where we could we could define, you know, what a page is about, what sections of the page are about. We can say this is this is an FAQ, this is a video, this is um, you know, a product page where somebody can purchase. And yeah, search engines are smart enough to figure it out on their own, but what if you could define those fields in a way that that they could literally database them and say, okay, you've got a product on this page and here are the product attributes. Um, or you, if you're writing an article about a specific topic and it's got, you know, know, five, 10 subtopics and Google's looking at those subtopics going, are you talking about this or talking about this? Thanks to structured markup, you can say this thing, right? Mentions this word and this is what this is about. And you can basically say this word means wikipedia.org slash this word. And they go, oh, so when you're talking about cars, you're talking about the Disney movie because you went to wikipedia.com slash, you know, cars movie or whatever it happens to be, not just talking about cars as a vehicle. Um, so it, it really allows webmasters to help structure their pages so that search engines can can fully understand the meanings of, of the words and the elements yeah. that are on those pages, ergo the semantic web. And and you know, with Google's knowledge graph, which they they created as a, a way to for them to understand, you know, what's um, you know, when someone says a, a business name, you know, that becomes I hate using the word entity because it sounds so nerdy, but it, it's it's what Google's using as an entity in their their version of what might be Wikipedia, right, in their knowledge graph, so that when somebody performs a query, they can look in their database and say, okay, what entities do I have for this? Um, all right, this one matches with that, and let me try this result and see if users respond to it. If they click and they stay, great, this was a good result. I'm going to show this more often. So this whole idea of building a knowledge graph by by really defining to web crawlers what things are on your web page, 
the structure of how your site's organized using breadcrumbs. You know, the, the FAQs that they could show as rich results beneath your listing in the search results. The video or image thumbnail that could appear, the star ratings that could show up underneath your listing in Google. All of those different elements provide rich results, which do help users and do get the clicks a lot of the time. And as long as the page itself solves the problem, your, your rankings will continue to grow as long as you're getting the clicks and they're staying on your website. So I love this idea of the semantic web. And I think in 2003, as we're all getting smarter as marketers, as small businesses and local businesses are getting smarter with how they're managing their website content and how content management systems themselves are getting smarter, uh, I think we're all gonna be paying more and more attention to it. I met some folks uh, while I was at the, the G50 summit last year from WordLift, Word L-I-F-T. And I took a look at what they were doing to create a knowledge graph to help search engines and to help users. It was incredible technology. And it's one little script you put into your website, then you log into the system and you start defining what things are, right? And then you click publish and it does all that structured markup coding for you. Um, super, super smart tool, very cool technology. Um, and I absolutely have seen enough data between what, what they've showed me and what we've been testing that I know that using entities and, and so forth are, are a benefit to SEO. There was one site in particular we were looking at for one of our clients last year. It was, um, it was a CBDFX. And if you look at their product pages, and there's an extension I use in Chrome to really just take a, a sneak peek at, uh, at the schema. It's the SEO Pro extension and it's by Marketing Syrup. And if you install this little free extension and you click on the schema tab, when you're on one of CBDFX's uh, product or category pages, you can see the amount of, of uh, entities that they've specified within their markup. Super, super brilliant stuff and um, really clear to search engines what things are. I think that's gonna become more important. And I think hopefully every site will be using this word lift um, not just to help search engines, but also to help you know users as we you know try to understand content a little bit better. So very excited about that growth and that change. And if you're not using WordLift in 2024, you're probably going to get flanked. <laughs> so interesting, man. I'm excited to see how the semantic web, this whole you know kind of the whole story develops over this next year. Um, it feels like we're gonna we're entering kind of a new era of the internet in a sense with artificial intelligence. This and has been else around since 2013. Yeah, I was, about to, I was about to say the semantic <laughs> web is actually not new at all. Um, yeah. It's you know it started with Hummingbird in 2013, and, and Google's been indexing and gathering not data. Serious. It exactly it's actually strings to thing is right. Yeah. So um, you know, and if you want to get geeky, you know, and ontologies and things like that. But, um, y you know, it, it really all comes down to trust, right? And it comes down to a, a big keyword that you said there, Steve, and that is meaning. Yeah. Um, my favorite example of semantics is wedding band. Uh, although I like your car's example too. Um, but if you type into Google search wedding band, what's going to come up? Is it going to come up a ring? Is it going to come up with a band that plays wedding songs, <laughs> you know, and you can extrapolate that data even further outward, you know, and see a lot. And there's, there's obviously with wedding, you know, there's a lot bands, there's a lot of different uh, similarities and things that kind of tie it all together. Um, and the last point I'll just make is as you were talking about this, I was thinking about, you know, again, chat GPT and, you know, it will remember up to 3,000 words, basically, of prompts that you put in. And we're going to show this in an example when we go over our SEO myths. Um, you know, but it is using basically semantic correlations between its data set and what you're putting in and what the output it is. And it's tying it all together, basically. So um, the, the best thing I can say is, is you know, going back to, you know, we're, we've definitely got some good themes here, actually, by the way. Because if you go back to EAT, right, E-E-A-T, you know, all of that ties also into semantics. Because the more that you are explaining things and providing information to your customers on your website, around the web in general, uh, the easier it is 
for tools like Google, like ChatGPT, et cetera, to understand the meaning behind you, like you, Steve, you said, as an entity. Because that is, at the end of the day, that's what you are. You're an entity. Yeah. Um, You're an entity, man. You're an entity. Who are you calling an entity? <laughs> hey, I, I got a real fun exercise that you can do if you are a local business, if you want to play around a little bit with this stuff, is um, you know when you when you perform a search for the type of business you are, um, take a look at the categories that the competition are using in their Google business profiles, yeah. um, and because it might not be what you think. You might be a bar and grill, and um, you see the the competition uh, all using the category. I don't know. Uh, American restaurant or something like that, right? Take a look at those categories and then go in and, and swap your category for the um, for the same one that the top competitors who are ranking for that keyword are ranking for and see if it improves your ranking because now you're telling the search engine um, a little bit more about what type of entity you are. There's And there's some fun tools you can probably you know find online for reverse engineering competitor categories, yeah. but the category itself you know is, is part of that knowledge graph. So doing some tests to see if, switching the category around to what's working for the competition. You know, um, you might think of yourself one way, but search engines might interpret you in another way. So um, something to play around with and, and it's really easy to do. Just go into Google Maps and just start reverse engineering the categories of the top competitors. Maybe run some frequencies and look at the top 20 or 30 and see which ones are you know showing up the most often. You might find that you've selected the wrong category for your business. Yeah, the, the the one tool I use for that is called GMB Spy. Um, Ooh, there's another, that, yeah. yeah, GMB Spy. It's a Chrome extension. It's free. You just click on it and it tells you the the category and the subcategories. You can also use a tool called Plepper, P L E P E R. Uh, it's got a also a Chrome extension uh, after you register, and it'll actually analyze all of the Google Maps search results and give you a category percentage breakdown and a review percentage breakdown. Tons of stuff. So cool. Yeah, it's, it is really cool. <laughs> All right. What's next? So let's, let's keep, keep it moving. Uh, let's try to let's see if we can get through um, the rest of these uh, discussion points over the next like, 10 minutes. Uh, everyone here who's watching, thank you guys so much for <laughs> hanging with us. Um, and let's keep going. This has been right. awesome. So uh, as part of the bold predictions, uh, Ben, you have uh, kind of an exchange here with ChatGPT. The the font might be a little bit too. Yeah, I can't read uh, it. Small. Maybe you can yeah. just kind of. Uh, so, maybe you can I'll, break I'll, it down just, real fast. Yeah, I'll just say it real quick. So, the first thing I said was write a hundred word review, basically for a personal injury lawyer in California. Uh, all I can say is is that the review was spot on. It was great. It wrote a nice positive review, and then I said make it negative, and the lawyer's name is Ben GPT. Right, and then it did. It wrote a negative review, actually, for for Jim BPT, the personal injury lawyer. So, um, so it's it's kind of interesting how it can be actually used for something like that. Um, what I haven't done with that is try to do it again. Oh, the again negative again. FTO this is going to create. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, this is the bad part. So, and then, well, no, actually, this is a good part. So the next thing I did, well, and by the way, Steve, yes, it, the, they're already using this to create negative reviews we're already seeing it happen so um but the other cool thing is this is that you know when you're replying to reviews at scale right you know of course you can use templates just like you have in bird eye um, but i wanted to go ahead and see like okay so what would happen if i wanted to write a review response and i don't have the time to do say more than thanks uh which we see too often and so i said write a, and i had to actually do this quite a few times to get it right, but this ended up doing it perfectly multiple times. Write a human review response to a review written by Tess that states, and then I put in the copy of the actual review, okay? Which was, what an amazing job you have done getting fraudulent reviews removed. Thank you. And then I put that in there, and this was the response. It says, thank you so much for taking the time to leave a kind review for stage band. Uh, we're thrilled to hear that you're happy with the job because previously I put state man as a prompt, by the way. Uh, we're thrilled to hear that you had a, uh, that you're happy with the job we've done in getting the fraudulent reviews removed. We understand how damaging fake reviews can be, and it's our top priority to protect our clients' reputation and business. We're so glad that we were able to help you. Your satisfaction is our top priority. Blah 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 blah. So 
that is just a good example of, oh my God, that's a great review response. And I didn't have to write it. But you can also see, interestingly enough, how it's taken bits and pieces of data from all over the place, probably to assemble this review response. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see this and, in, in, you know, everything that we're doing. I'm sure Bird Eye is going to have something as well, but you could, you mm -hmm. could do something where um, uh, there's a, a button that says, add your voice. That's what I want to see, because I love that there's, there's so many cool things that help us figure yeah. out what we should say and what we should do. But I really think everything before it can get approved or published has to go through and add your voice where you've got to change something. You know, I think that's what I'd like to see in, in everything. Is, I, I know, wonder if, <clears throat> I'm going to have to try that, Steve, because I wonder <laughs> if you put in a prompt and you stated that this is my tone, yeah. if it would then take that and flow basically into that's a uh, whole number more. Number. <laughs> yeah, it is. It definitely is. Because, uh, yeah, anyway. So really quickly about that, um, I think it's going to be used more for, for things like this, which I, I personally don't encourage this, by the way. That's not what I'm saying. I just wanted to see if it could be done. Um, I like genuine review responses. Um, but my prediction is, is that it is going to get used and it's probably going to get abused. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep awesome. your eyes on it. So let's talk a little bit more about where Google business profiles are headed. And... This business center, this place where local businesses are, you know, managing their online presence on Google. Um, where are they headed? What's the what's the what is Google, you know, pu pu pushing towards Ben? Um, okay. And I'm just this. I'm literally going to burn through this really quickly. Um, I don't think we need to dwell too long here. All I can say is is that video I think is going to be huge for Google Business Profiles. It's been kind of under the radar in the past, um, you know, but we're seeing little little indications about how important they are. The one big important one is, is that review, when you do a review response and you include a video, which previously was very difficult to do, um, we're now seeing videos, and uh, Darren Shaw or Whitespark showed this, um, that a review that I left for Whitespark a year ago still shows up as most relevant because it has a video attached to it. Interesting. So we know the images kind of help do that too, but of that of glowing review, staying up for a year, man, that's pretty important actually from a conversion standpoint. Um, you know, and they're making it easier to get video, you know, into Google Business Profiles in general. It's just as easy as adding an image, but you know, where that's going to go and where those are going to surface is a whole nother, another discussion. Yeah, think, think Zios and and table placards that say while you're waiting, record a video review or just some little hints to your customers. Yeah. Maybe they're at point of sale, right? After you purchase, before you head out, don't forget to leave us a video review. Just little exactly. hints and only with 1% do it, it's still much better than zero. They're, they're at the crazy. restaurant and you say, hey, would you mind leaving a review and, you know, tell us how you liked Carol and how does, and how did she do for you, you know? Yeah. Um, that's uh, a great idea. The next thing is fewer post card verifications. This has been kind of out in the wild for a while now. It's going to get more intense. There are certain categories, which I can't say, that are going to still have to do postcard. Uh, and even after you do a video verification, you might still have to do a postcard. It's a might. There's Anyway, it depends, I guess, is really what it comes down to. It's trust thing. Um, the war on fake reviews. Okay, so this is the part that everybody hates, but I'm sure everybody in the audience is feeling. Um, they turned up the review filter dial immensely last year. So when you wake up in the morning and you're missing 10 out of your 100 reviews, uh, this is a feature, not a bug. This is Google going back through your reviews and getting rid of questionable reviews. When you have a client, that says that they have left you a review and it, you don't see it. This is also a feature, not a bug. This is Google not trusting either you or that review. My hint or tip here is, is this. Don't use the link that's in Google Business Pro, in your Google Business Profile to get a review. Do a QR code instead. And with that QR code, just have it do a natural search for the name of your business, location, and the zip code. It'll bring up your knowledge panel and also you can even prompt it to bring up the review box. But this is what Google's looking for, a natural search. 
um, even though they provide you that link. But when they do that, <laughs> the chances of them getting filtered is extremely high. Um, the only thing I will say is this is really quickly is if you do have this kind of problem, especially with the new review ghost, which is what we were just discussing, you can always make sure, uh, I want to encourage you to make it a part of your business practice is to gather screenshots of reviews from your customers. Also, you can do screenshots of the email notifications for those reviews. Why do you want to do this? Because if they are gone and they're legitimate reviews, which of course you're going to say, everybody says, you know, they're always legitimate reviews, which most of the time they are. You can come to the Google business profile community. You can start a thread and provide those screenshots. And then we can actually ask Google to find them. They will go, it goes through the trust team. They will go ahead and look for the review. They will find them and they will gauge them basically to see if they're fake or not. Uh, or if they meet a certain type of criteria, and then they will restore them. So very important to do that, um, to combat this. And Steve, why don't you go ahead and, and let's talk about uh, updating listings. Oh yeah, that's that's a big one. I've, and I've, I've seen the back end of, of what you do, Ben, and it's, it's amazing to me how many competitors will try to change your business information to hurt your rankings. Yeah. So it's it's borderline scary, you know, the, the amount of times that somebody had gone in and said, oh, no, they're not open 24 hours. Oh, no, they don't do such and such. Or their phone number's actually, and they put in their number, right? All sorts of crazy things that they'll try to do to, you know, to affect your rankings. And if you miss the email, you know, a month later, you'll look at your profile and it'll be completely wrong. So they'll they'll send emails sometimes saying, hey, the, someone has suggested a change or what have you. So um, I just make it a best practice. every Every week, Monday morning, get up. You know, log in, look at your, your business information, log in, to, you know, you know, you have to log into it. It's right there in the search results. And if you see anything inaccurate or you see a pending change, uh, make your, your update or deny the change um, and you're good to go. It takes probably 30 seconds a week, maybe even faster as you start doing it more and more often. So once a week, just get in and make sure it's accurate. And, you know, the way, the way that we've always um, from, you know, local SEO experts, specialists, whatever you want to call us, um, the way that we've looked at local search is that that the data itself is sort of the nucleus of the of the cell of local SEO. And if the, the data is wrong, it doesn't matter how much um, your landing page perform, how well your landing page performs, or how many business citations you have, if it's inaccurate, or how many reviews you have. If, if Google can't validate that that data is consistent where it needs to be consistent online, then it might scrutinize it and you might not get that ranking. So um, you know, platforms like, like BirdEye allow you to manage data at scale um, and manage the data that goes into the databases that feed the web directories that host that information. Um, you know, we're not just talking about search engines, navigation engines, social local sites <clears throat> like uh, Foursquare and Facebook. We're also talking about you know business directories and local directories and industry directories. So a lot of places that it matters. So okay. I I would say if there were one thing that I could do and I only had you know 30 minutes a month, just make sure your business information is accurate. Yeah, and it goes back to you know Google understanding about your entity, right? I mean, if the information that you have on Yelp, say, or whatever, is completely different than what you have in Google My Business and Google Business Profile, what is it to believe? You know, if the information on your Google Business Profile doesn't match what's on your website, I see this happen all the time. By the way, you know, what is Google to believe? So, um, and how is Google going to be able to understand? you know, what your entity is like, you know, okay, well, you say you're open 24 hours, you know, but we have a screenshot showing that you're open from 8am to 9pm, which is yeah. it, <laughs> you know? So yes, absolutely, Steve, totally keep, keep it up to date. Yeah. What's next, Justin? And, and you go. know, on that, on that last point, that's, you know, that's exactly what we at BirdEye try to solve. And so, you know, with our private API with Google, but it's not just with Google, we're, you know, you're with BirdEye, you're able to manage the business listings on Bing, Facebook, Google, over 200 different websites from one spot within the BirdEye platform. And that's where that real value comes in, especially if you have a ton of locations, being able to manage all of those things, making sure that they're all accurate. So you don't have Bing saying one thing, Google saying another, and then Facebook, something else. Yep, something else. You're yeah. able to manage it all correctly, accurately from one place. It makes it a million times easier. It just, yep. you know, especially if you, like you said, Steve, you only have 30 minutes a week. How do you, are we able to do that? Especially if you have 50, 100, 200 business locations. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Um, 
it's just too much yep. and so yeah having something yeah. you know like a, you have to use a tool platform. like you have to use tool like bird eye you have no choice yeah awesome so let's uh, we've got some really moving. great questions coming in by the way but we should answer those right towards the tail end i can burn yeah. through them very quickly i'm sure yeah, these are some, some really really good ones coming in um and then also yeah the in the attendee chat and the q a so let's go ahead and try to get through these local seo myths yep uh our residential myth buster ben uh, let's go ahead and talk about this first one. And with this, and with this uh, segment, uh, we've done this in every single one of our local search expert series episodes so far. It's one of my favorites. And this one is going to be more so uh, the expert versus artificial intelligence. And we're going to see uh, who's who is the real expert, so to speak. So Ben, let's with this first one. Uh, what do you have here? Okay. So um, all right. So hi, Ben GPT here. So <laughs> setting up a service area impact local ranking. The real answer is no, it doesn't impact the ranking at all. And there's no mechanism in Google to, to see your service area and rank you better. Uh, however, chat GPT says it is going to help you impact your ranking. As a matter of fact, it goes over on, on it for about two paragraphs, uh, even though it states that it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not guaranteed for higher ranking. It does state that, so I will give it that. All right, let's go to the next one. All right. All right, so then I asked it, I said, okay, well, how about geotagging? This is an age old question, by the way, right? Uh, which is, you know, the process of adding geographic information such as longitude and latitude to a media file like a photo or a video. Quick answer, it doesn't work. It's a waste of time. Anybody selling you services about geotagging is basically a snake oil salesman trying to give you some type of value for what oh, you're man, spending. All that time I, I put together for doing KML files, Ben? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but well, according to chat GPT, it is, it does work. Um, it doesn't. Sorry. Next. I said, so, um, okay, how about keywords in review responses? It says it works. We can tell this is so 2021, by the way. Um, there have been many case studies done actually about this and keywords in your review responses do not help with your SEO at all. So stop putting in personal injury lawyer, personal injury lawyer, then blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, it's just not gonna work. Um, it's actually been kind of even refuted that keywords in your review from a customer will help your SEO ranking. I kind of believe it does, but I mean, I think there needs to be more studies actually done to, to figure that think, one out. I think the customer's say feature that you see sometimes will, will bold the words that somebody would have queried. I see mm -hmm. that once in a while where, you know, uh, it'll actually display a, a snippet from a review yeah. if it includes the word. But whether that helps with ranking or not, I don't know. But it does it does probably have an impact on click-through rate and, and uh, search behavior signals. Exactly. Well, you know, the thing that I say it is, is, and we talked about this in our last webinar, is yeah. it helps from a conversion standpoint because it helps a new user who's reading it understand what you do. Again, we're going, going back to meaning <laughs> and understanding. Right. So, um, so I mean, I would still encourage it, but yeah, don't look, don't don't step into your replies. It doesn't help. Okay. Next one. And I said, well, can you cite the sources for the answers that you provided? And basically, no. Chat GPT will tell you it specifically cannot cite sources. Um, there's another example that I did where with uh, on on Twitter, where I was asking it what eat is. And then I asked it to cite the sources and it spat back a whole bunch of sources, one from uh, Neil Patel and one from um, Rand Fishkin. And guess what? Rand Fishkin never published a blog post about eat hmm. ever, but it still showed it as a source. So be careful if you're going to, when you're looking at the, 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 the moral of the story here is just be very careful with chat GPT because it's not 100% accurate and it's not using sources for that they can cite. Um, and so that's a problem. Not your SEO expert. Yeah. Exactly. Trust your, well, trust your SEO expert, right? Okay, cool. I think that was the last one. Uh, we actually have one more. Oh. 
Oh yeah, I said, what if I told you these do not impact ranking? <laughs> um, and it says, if the information provided that Google stacking, setting up a service area, geotagging, including keywords, it basically spat it all back out. It would mean that these practices, while they may be beneficial for other reasons, would not be considered the search engine, uh, basically an impact on ranking. So in other words, it's agreeing with me. <laughs> Awesome. So, cool. So yeah, we have a ton of great it. questions. Um, and before we do, let's just do a quick run through of the key takeaways and a couple of tips. Uh, the first one being create content with your audience in mind, not Google. And Ben, this is something you've talked about before we touched on it in the live stream. Um, what exactly does that mean in a quick summary, if you're, you're able to? Sure, sure. I'll make it extremely quick. Uh, you know, th there's an advantage to, to uh, people like Steve and I, right? that started back in the 90s. And when we started back in the 90s, there was no Google, 94 specifically. Uh, Google didn't come Easter. out. Yeah, <laughs> Google didn't come out until 1998, and it was back rub actually. Um, but, you know, so when you were doing SEO back in those days, you would always have to create your content, your links, everything that you were doing from a digital marketing perspective, um, which became SEO, was done with the consumer in mind. It was done with your, because, you know, I wanted, if I had a, I was working with a radio station, right? And local radio station and up in Flagstaff. And so what did we do? We got links from college students web pages at NAU to drive traffic to the radio station's website that we had just built. You know, we did promotions. There was the Y2K bug. We actually got a Volkswagen bug and wrapped in Y2K stuff. Uh, you know, but this was j done to to build traffic and to build interest in the brand itself. Um, all these things end up working for SEO. This is the point, really. So create it with the people in mind, and Google will follow. That's really what it comes down to. I got I got one good example for you. We had an attorney um, who did a local event, and he gave away helmets to uh to students as helmet safety day right i don't know if it was one of those national calendars or whatever but nice. decided hey let's let's do something for the community let's um let's do a uh you know free helmets for kids giveaway and we'll bring people over to the office we'll have some snacks and do some things and then the the street team working with the, the firm went around to all the local businesses in the area went to the chamber of commerce went to the local news station went to the newspaper and they said hey we're doing this cool thing and we're you know trying to help the community could you promote it for us name, address, phone number, right? And, and uh, an actual business citation across dozens of local websites, across new sites. Um, people wanted to promote that. It was a really fun thing. So we got we got free referral traffic and Google, of course, picked up all those, those citation instances. And some of them even had links back to the attorney's website. So it was a, it was a massive win for the attorney and the attorney had a fun little uh, event row in the search result for the event markup that we put on the page so that you know we we stood out in the search result it was a like a triple win we had a better search experience and got more click-through rate we got nap a name address phone number instances which moved us up in the map pack and we got links out of it and that was just doing day-to-day -day regular marketing that had an seo benefit to it you know that's awesome yeah awesome Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and rattle through these last pieces. Um, just a heads up, if you missed anything during the webinar, the recording will be made available. Um, but just as a wrap up, we, um, for the second one, keep an eye on web traffic from pages two through six. Uh, as of right now, we haven't seen any impacts on rankings or anything like that with the continuous scroll from Google. Um, but I still think that that's something that, that, you know, to keep an eye on as time goes on, just to see uh, how search behavior is, you know, as Ben was, or as Steve was saying, you know, with more transactional kind of stuff, you might not see much of an impact, but maybe on the research uh, information kind of side. Uh, next is 2023 is the year of AI, but as we just saw with these SEO myths, there, it still has a ways to go. Um, so, you know, just be aware, it's going to be kind of like the wild west out there. Um, tools are going to be coming out left and right um, and all kinds of, you know, cool and scary stuff. Uh, so, just keep your eyes open for that. Uh, the last one is, or the next one is web 3.0 or the semantic web uh, is here and approaching. <laughs> so uh, so uh, keep that in mind as well. And then lastly, Start keep your Google lift. lift. Yeah, <laughs> say that one more time. Ben. Start playing with word lift. Word lift. 
Awesome. And then the last one is keep your Google business profiles and all of your business listings on any of those websites uh, up to date, accurate, and buzzing with activity. Um, so that is what we have for today's discussion. And uh, here in just a second, we will go and answer some questions. And so let's see what we can find here. We've received a ton of questions. Um, let me see. Well, and also, if I would add one more to this is make sure you're, you're checking out those checklists and little walkthrough videos and so forth that Justin's going to share. There's lots of, uh, of really great ideas. And uh, I'll also make sure he has a copy of the, the content audit uh, template so that you can you know give it to a, an intern, a college student, a cousin, a friend and say, hey, can you audit my page and tell me whether or not this page, you know, um, could be improved or not. Awesome. Cool. And so the first question that we have is um, how many posts should we do weekly on Google business profiles? All of them. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. <laughs> the um, yeah. Well, I mean, when, the fact of the matter is, is when you're looking at a big brand, um, you know, or a franchise, you know, just do one a week. If you can do one a week, you're fine. Um, obviously, if you have more to say, then say it, um, you know, but yeah, just do one a week. They stay up there for like six months. And I think it's up to 15 or 10 that, that stay in the in the carousel. So, yeah, just, just do one. That's fine. Awesome. Yep, whatever you have going on in a given week. We have, we have a restaurant chain we work with, and they do, um, I think, two or three posts a week, depending on what campaigns they're running. Hey, we're going to run a, a drink campaign um, you know, for a new drink that we're doing. Oh, but we also have a food special happening. So they'll do two different posts during the week to talk about those different um, events that are coming up. Um, yep. And look, you know, another way to determine how many you should be doing is look at the type of posts that you can do and, and then ask, you know, everyone, you know, in a location, do we, do we have something relevant to these different categories? Do we have an event this week? Do we have a special, a promo? Is there a video that we want to share? And if, if there is something, share it, you know, and if there isn't, then, you know, wait till the next week and ask the same question. Yep, exactly. Um, the next one that we have is uh, oh, where do you where do you submit those review screenshots, Ben, that you were mentioning earlier? What is yeah, that? Yeah, um, I've put it into our chat, so if that could be shared. But basically, it's support.google.com slash business slash community. Make sure that when you come in, you mention your business name, your address, and you also have a link to your Google business profile that's being affected. Um, and then you want to have like a Google Drive folder, and you have your screenshots in that Google Drive folder. And so uh, when you do that, then a product expert like myself can go ahead and escalate that and send it over to Google. We, it's, we'll get a response sooner or later. You know, if you don't hear from us like in a couple of weeks, then you can come back and say, hey, just out of curiosity, is there some kind of an update or not? And then we'll be able to tell you basically whether the result has been fixed. Uh, meaning that it's either a positive or a negative result, but they don't tell us what that is. So if the review pops back up, obviously positive result. Um, can you create a Google business profile if you have a mobile business or uh, all house calls? Absolutely. Yes, you can. It happens all the time. Um, yes, absolutely. A service area based business, like you're running out of your home, basically you're running it out of your home. So your home is your office. Um, what you will need, and a lot of people don't do this, what you will need is like a utility bill or a business license registered to your home address. You don't, you're not showing your address, but you need this for Google because if Google ever suspends you, guess what? You need it. And if you don't have it, it's going to take you like 30 days to get it. So you're going to be down for 30 days. So, yes. Great question. Um... We've got another one here, and uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of the questions that we're uh, that we're receiving right now. Um, but we will have somebody reach out uh, and and provide an answer. So no worries there. Uh, this next one we have is how different does your content creation have to be between platforms? You know, for example, uh, an update on Nextdoor versus Facebook versus your website's blog. Does it hurt your ranking if they're all the same update? I don't know. I think from a duplicate content standpoint, your 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 page with that same context might get omitted from the search results because it's too similar to what you have somewhere else. Um, I think every platform kind of has its own audience, so I would I would look at at what's working for the competition. What do you see in the results? The the you know it's working for the competitors. 
um, and then cater your strategy around what the audience responds to best. Uh, for example, it's kind of a weird one, but we have a, a watch company we work with and they really wanted to, to grow their Instagram followers. That was a big thing for them. So they studied the, the competition to see how users interacted and how often they interacted with types of content. Was it a lifestyle image? Um, or was it a close-up of a wrist and a watch? What was it you know, that really got the most engagement? Um, and then they, they tested and they catered their strategy based on what uh, they saw getting the most engagement for the competition. I don't think you ever need to guess at anything because there's enough um, successful businesses out there that um, have already sort of paved the road for you. All you have to do is figure out what's worked for them and then do something a little bit better. Um, I, I know we're out of time. I just want to say if anybody has a Google business profile question that they really need answered, uh, like the last question that we have is like a really, really important one. But if anybody does have a question, um, feel free to just reach out to me on Twitter, um, the social dude. My DMs are open. You can just go ahead and pop me a question. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to answer. Or if you just want to email me, that's fine too. You can reach me at steadydemand.com. So just wanted to throw that out there because a lot of good questions here. Yeah, we've received a ton of great questions. I'm still going through them all. Um, and we even added extra time for this episode, like 30 minutes more than our previous ones. And we're still running up to the uh, to the end here, uh, which is good. I mean, it's much, much. I think it's much better to have so much to talk about um, that would, we might just have to do another another uh, a second part to this series, kind of a sequel. Um, so that, that is all of the time that we have today. Um, but before we go, be sure to register for our February webinar. Um, the link is in the related content tab. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and for sticking with us for so long. I know it was a little bit longer of a session, but hopefully you got some great value out of it. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about how Bird Eye can help automate and help your online reputation management strategy, as well as make it scalable, email us anytime at events at birdeye.com. Ben and Steve, thank you guys again so much for your time. Thanks, it's, Justin. It's thank always you. a blast. Um, I'm gonna have I, I went ahead and I already saved that AI generated superhero photo of me. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to use that. <laughs> Jay, make your profile picture, man. <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about doing that on the the intro slide where my headshot was. I thought about changing it to that for today. Um, but with that being said, everybody, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we'll get. We'll, you can expect uh, the recording to be sent over. I think it's 24 hours for it to process and take care of everything. Uh, so you can get an email. You'll get an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. Um, and keep an eye out for uh, our experts who are going to be reaching out to you guys with answers to your questions as well. Um, but until then, we'll see you guys next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.